Without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our executive director, Kim Jackson. Do I hand the mic to you, to her? I have my own. You got it? All right. You're, you don't need any introduction. So I hope that you guys enjoy yourselves. Thank you. And I'll pass the baton. Thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Kimberly Jackson, and I'm the executive director for the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. And I'm so honored tonight to have an in-person audience, along with our virtual audience, to talk about the intersection of arts and the economy. I know people don't really understand that that is such an important part of how our county has grown and evolved. But it's certainly important to our school, and we're very honored, I'll introduce her personally, to have Dean Barbara Hubbard with us, who has personally um, driven the arts over our county, and particularly for our school over the past couple of decades, I think that's fair. <laughs> so the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions is the gift of Congressman Young. It's a think tank that was created for St. Petersburg College and the Florida College System to explore social, political, and economic nonpartisan topics in a way that we can push policy and make sure that we enlighten the public about how they engage. And with that, we're going to start and introduce our panel. We have a very dynamic panel tonight. First, starting with Ken Hannon, who's the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Dedean Fine Arts Center. We're so grateful and honored to have you. Along with Christine Emanuel Carter, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the Executive Director of the Leeper Ratner Museum of Art at St. Petersburg College. You're gracious enough to host us tonight against this beautiful backdrop, and we're so thankful. And then we have Sharon Reed Kane, who's the Vice President and Chief Education and Community Engagement Officer with the Marsha P. Hoffman School of the Arts at the Ruth Eckert Hall. And we have Robert Stackhouse, who is a renowned local artist who was recently featured here in the museum. And then tonight, um, Dean Hubbard likes, uh, there's a joke that I will add. She likes to say the comment, you're welcome. It's a comment among the college team because she says the arts make everything better. So her tagline is, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> On top of it, though, she's a dynamic advocate for artists of all genres, and our students um, are able to explore who they really are and learn how to make a profit while doing what they love. So with that, Dean, I'm very grateful for your time and for you gathering today with your colleagues. Um, so take it away. All right, everybody. What we're going to do tonight, thank you. What we're going to do tonight is have a conversation. Um, I know all of these panelists, and I have interacted with many of them on projects, and um, I think the conversation will be a fluid one, it will be a good one, and then Kimberly will ask probably at the end for any of your comments or questions. All right, panelists, are you ready? Okay, all right, relax, because this is going to be a conversation. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ken. Um, how do artists contribute to the growth of any region, specifically Pinellas County? I think, the, uh, I think the better answer would be how don't they? <laughs> uh, from, from the uh, economic standpoint, of course, of uh, creating jobs and, and uh, um, contributing real dollars in, in a real economy, um, they also create a sense of, an, a sense of place that becomes so important. I, uh, we, had, we did some branding work in Dunning back some years ago, and the, uh, the city found out that it, second to its beautiful be beaches, which we all have here in Pinellas, arts and culture were the num was the number two reason why people moved to visit or you know, stay in in some way engage in Dunedin. That's a huge statement about a lot of dollars flowing in and out of our economy based on the arts. Thank you. Sharon, how about your views? So I would definitely agree with that. Um, what I would add as examples of A lot going on art-wise in, in uh, Pinellas County in a way. There were the institutions, um, they were you know, the Dali wasn't the world-class attractor that it is now, and uh, all, the, all the subsequent uh, uh, institutions that have built up around it and made this really, a, a, you know, a, a destination, an art destination. Um, but what, what 
happens, you know, artists are, are quite often thought of as somebody who can come in and, and create a place. You know, but you have to have a place to do that in. And it's, it's a, a difficult kind of thing because uh, when you're an artist and you're, you're kind of un, unattached to an institution, you're not having any backing at all. And uh, if you're trying to do any kind of enterprise, uh, we saw this happen on the 600 block of St. Pete early on, where the city gave artists really reduced rents in order to have a studio and, and maybe a little shop up front. Well, that didn't last very long. W one, the artists weren't really uh, able to make the nut, so to speak, to, to uh, afford that place, and the landlords got really angry <laughs> that, that all this was going on. And, and uh, so, you know, artists making a place is, is, uh, is, is a very difficult thing. I think one thing Carol and I did, we bought a 25,000 square foot building in, in St. Pete. And we had to go through zoning and city council to convince the city that we could live and work there. And, and so the whole idea of live work was something that they didn't quite understand at the time. They kept wanting to make us a, a hotel, a factory, or something or another. Well, where's your, where's your store? Well, we don't have a store, we have a studio, right? So there's a different model for, for things. But I think what's happened out of that is you can see that uh, Pinellas County is really an attractor now to, to, uh, to artists to move here and to, to develop a place. Now, they've done that more in St. Pete because they've had a head start in a way, but places, places in North County, I, I, you know, Largo's doing a lot, Dunedin's done a lot, and, and it's moving up this way, and it, it needs to be up here. Carol and I moved from St. Pete to Tarpon Springs, and so we're very cognizant of what it's like up here. So I think, I think artists have made a change in, in, uh, in the area. Thank you for your um, thoughtful comments, all of you. And Christine, you've got the next question because I think you have um, a really good uh, insight to what types of grants could be available to artists in Pinellas County? That is a good question. Um, considering I'm rather new to this position of director, but I am also uh, first and foremost an artist and have been a curator and done just about every other thing in the arts in this community. Um, and we couldn't do it without, uh, first and foremost, the support of institutions like St. Pete College, obviously, um, but also uh, the arts councils, like the Arts Council of Hillsborough County is extremely important to supporting artists. Uh, and Creative Pinellas has done unbelievable things in this area, and I'm actually uh, a full circle moment with Creative Pinellas, all that they do from emerging artists to micro grants to professional artists, which Robert Stackhouse has a great experience with being an artist laureate along with Carol Mickett. Um, but they also are inhabiting a space in Largo that used to be the Gulf Coast Museum of Art, which was a longstanding institution for the arts from the 1930s to about 2009 when it closed. And that property sat vacant for a while, and uh, when the county took it over, and now Creative Pinellas is there, it's become a hub for all levels of artists of all mediums in the area. It's a co-op space, it's an exhibition space, um, it's a place where we as arts professionals come together and converge and share ideas. So those are just some of the opportunities that are afforded to us um, as artists and, and for local grants. Of course, there's national, international grant opportunities. Um, the Tampa Bay Business for Arts and Culture uh, Hillsborough Arts Council I mentioned, and then of course the Pinellas Community Foundation. So there's a lot of opportunity, but really it's that network of artists and, and a lot of the crux of that is from Creative Pinellas, I think. Yes, thank you. Any of you um, involved with Culture Builds Florida, any of the, can you talk about that, uh, your involvement with the state? Sure, so we're very fortunate. Obviously, Ruth Eckert Hall focuses more on performing arts, but we're very fortunate to have support at all different levels. Um, I think this is a little bit of a trick question, though. I think the very fact that you asked this question explains that it might be difficult to find. Um, 
there are opportunities. I think artists are fearless by nature, but I do think um, it's a little more difficult to seek out that funding. And what I would say, just to tag on to what's been said earlier, is is you have to really be a self-promoter. And I know sometimes artists wince at that. Um, but I think you have to really make the effort to seek out those opportunities and seek out the people who will support you and connect you with the right funding. Thank you. Ken, we recently talked about you know, state grants and the process by which artists or organizations have to apply. Can you give us a brief overview of, of just the challenges and maybe the opportunities? Um, I can do it in one word, daunting. You know? <laughs> it's, uh, I, think, I think a lot, and people are getting better at this. I think uh, granting organizations are getting better. They realize that um, some of the information that they ask for might not be necessary and that all of the, the structure that's built into to some funding might not exactly be required. But uh, I, I think oftentimes we, we find that if you, if you take the time, it's worth the effort, you know. It, it may seem like a very um, difficult process and require a lot of uh, time. Uh, the return can be uh, very, very rewarding, though. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I think uh, we have to understand that everyone who's out there in, in some way offering money has to in some way answer to somebody for it. And, and that's, what they're, that's what all of this daunting kind of information is all about, is supplying information that, that they need and, and uh, in exchange for the support that we need. And it's a competitive process. It Robert? Is. Well, yeah, it's very competitive. I mean, they don't teach this in art school. Um, they, they quite often assume that, that a lot of artists are very self-promoting, and uh, uh, but a lot aren't. And uh, so it, it, it takes uh, more than one person sometimes. Uh, um, you know, the, an individual sub, uh, Self-promoting themselves can go really too much and become quite a bore with it. So you need you need the support. You need somebody backing you. And uh, so um, you know you you have things like like Creative Pinellas, which is really doing a, a, an excellent job in, in in bringing artists into an area where they can look at the uh, the the possibilities that are, that are in, in front of them. And there are becoming more and more possibilities, so there's, there's more optimism that way. Yeah, and this, I believe that this is the intersection of commerce and creativity. So, you know, we naturally need to seek a balance. But thank you again for mm -hmm. um, your insight. All right, Robert, I'm going to start with you for this next question. What types of small business opportunities do you think exist for artists? And let's be specific to maybe um, our uh, large county, maybe even the region. Uh, not many. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of alluded to it in a way. I mean, uh, the, the whole idea of art business, you know, sort of connotates you have a store and you, you sell your art. And uh, I think that's a very difficult thing. I mean, uh, I, I think artists all over the world can agree it's one thing to make art, it's one thing, another thing to show art, but it's really mm -hmm. difficult to convince somebody to take it home with them, right? And um, it's, it's a, 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 a tough proposition. I mean, artists make, even when they, they, they get successful in what they do, they don't make really what I consider a fair share. Um, for instance, just take a, a, a a countywide kind of program in, in uh, say, public art, uh, which is a statewide program mostly. But you know, no, no matter what the budget is, you probably, if you're really good at it, you can take home maybe 20%. After working for how long on that project, and some, some of these projects can take, we've worked on projects that have taken us years. So when you average that out, you're not making a, a good good amount of money. So. You know, there, there's that old saying, money makes art. And uh, you, get, you get into a, a tiered system in what the art world is. Uh, we see it sometimes as a monolithic thing. There are artists, right? And artists have work for sale. And, and artists can either sell it or not sell it. Uh, there are artists who sometimes get support from, from uh, the community, from, from corporations. 
Uh, there are artists that get lots of support from community organizations. So uh, there's a breakdown. What's the difference between um, you know, somebody trying to open a storefront in a strip mall and say, I have art for sale, and then think of the disparity or the, the wide gap between those artists that are dealing with the people at Tampa International Airport, where you're, you're talking budgets that are in the millions of dollars. And that's corporate support. I mean, uh, sometimes you, you look at a sculpture, the budget for the sculpture alone, let's say, is one thing. The budget for the engineering is equal to that, beyond sometimes that cost. So the artist has to sort of figure that kind of thing out. When an artist does these big projects, they do it because they really want to do it. Right. They really want to see it. Right. But the thing is, it's not always a money maker for them. And, and that's part of the other question for maybe the three other panelists to think about, because if we identify those opportunities, how do we get emerging artists, established artists, to understand what that education process is, if there is one, or that mentoring process, or hope you get lucky process. So what do you think, Christine? What, what are the opportunities to, for an artist in that realm? It's, well, I, I agree with a lot of what Robert said. Um, and, it, and, it, and it, of course, it depends on the discipline, whether it's performance or visual art. Um, but I think you, you actually brought up a good point, and this kind of tied into a, a question we haven't addressed yet, but I think mentors are very important. Um, and I've seen some interesting business models of, from Creative Clay. Mm -hmm. has a great business model for their um, artists, their, their member artists, but they are artists with disabilities that are paired one-on-one -on -one with a professional artist that kind of mirrors their interest. And that professional artist works with them to develop their, their work and also create a business model. So they're selling their work and in a ways that they weren't able to do before. And they have their own gallery and they have uh, supporters and you know a circle of donors. They have a street festival. So the business model extends from that one-on-one -on -one relationship to something that's much bigger and, and spreads into different parts of the community and that becomes something you know, much bigger. Um, I think that uh, it, it's, it's also interesting to be um, on the other side of it from a personal perspective, having grown up as the child of artists who made their living at the outdoor art festivals, which people don't realize that not only is it a lifetime of uh, commitment and um, education, it's a buying, it's selling a piece of your soul that goes into what it is you're creating. Um, it's the many years of dedication and then the overhead costs that people aren't thinking of as far as um, how you are the, you're the marketing director, you're the education director, you're the talent, you're the agent, you're doing everything, and you're the accountant for some reason. <laughs> so it very much is like a, 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 a small business in many ways, um, but I think it all kind of starts with some basic education. It's, it's also interesting as we de kind of deal with the um, digital world these days, which you literally have a business in your pocket. And growing up, we didn't have that. You had to drive a thousand miles to go to an art show. Hopefully you made enough money to eat and drive home and have a little bit extra in your pocket. But now you can have an Etsy store on your phone. You have, of course, there's a lot of competition and now it's about that personal brand. And that's something that um, the, the young people are, are starting to really embrace is that personal brand and you're selling yourself and you're selling your image and part of your soul to this. So it's all kind of investing in that so I think there's definitely a way where the old guard and the new school can kind of come together to really think about the future of the arts business in, a, in that way. Nice. Thank if, you. If I could have sure. a, a second to, to talk about the, the, that other part of the art job, kind of, if you will. Um, Robert and I were talking earlier, and he pointed out that he's the only one up here that doesn't draw a salary. 
And so we're, we're talking about people who are related to, we, we are in arts related jobs, making a living in art, supporting art, doing lots of different things in the art world. Um, but we're not doing it with the models that we've been talking about. We're, we're employed, um, we uh, provide a service, and I think there are lots of those kind of avenues too for artists. And I think that's, uh, whether it's an animation or uh, um, graphic design, um, uh, musicians, uh, you know, gigging, playing, teaching. Teaching is, uh, of course, a, a strong uh, a field for artists to... Uh, and I think that's, yeah. the, the, that's the real important part of the question, where we have maybe a history, but going forward, we don't have a blueprint or a plan. So for performing art, Sharon, what's the plan? Wow, that's a loaded question. Um, I, I'm not sure there is a one-size-fits-all plan. Um, I can tell you what I've been able to do from where I sit, and I do feel a responsibility, and I believe you know everyone here does, because we are in the arts, but in a different way than a working artist. I feel such a responsibility to help and support artists in any way that I can. So I talk with my team. Um, I have an in-house team of about five, but I employ over 100 adjunct teachers. Um, teaching artists throughout the year and I feel really good about that. I feel like I'm giving them um, viable day jobs, if you will, and that enable them to do what they love, which is to keep con you know, creating the art that they are so passionate about. But um, I was actually just talking with a team member a few days ago and I hear this conversation a lot when we start talking about agreements and contracts and they kind of glaze over and say, oh, I don't like to talk about the money part of this. So the first thing I usually say is don't say that to anyone else ever, um, <laughs> but it's a necessary evil. You have to be earning a living, and I think teaching is, a, is a, obviously really close to my heart, but it's such a valuable way for them to get exposure, for them to pass on the skills that they've learned. Um, I just think it's a wonderful kind of life circle of an artist if you are willing to do that and if you're willing to learn to teach what you are so good at. So that's the model that my particular department at the hall works with and it's been very successful. And as I said, in addition to reaching our students with such high quality arts instruction and experiences, the other part of that is I'm employing a lot of local artists. So um, there's always that piece to look at. Are you willing to give back and share what you're doing? Yeah, and I think this question is one of um, evolution mm -hmm. because I know at the college and some of the programs that we teach and mentor, we talk about writing contracts and negotiating for fees and salary. So um, to be continued. Um, okay, Ken, I'm going to start with you. We talked a little bit about corporations and maybe corporate partners. Um, do you know uh, of any in the area that you know you can say, oh yeah, the Dunedin Fine Arts Center or some of my faculty have partnered with certain corporations? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, some many of our faculties have uh, faculty have partnerships with um, uh, paint manufacturers, uh, brush uh, manufacturers, and those types of things that help them uh, with cash and uh, supplies in 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 their field. Um, I think the, the, the idea of, of developing partnerships is, is one that we need to start talking about very early in careers. It's, it's something that, that I think young artists and, and artists just starting out don't, may not feel that they're ready for, but there are so many opportunities for businesses that are also just starting out. That are uh, that are would fit uh, the the brand of, of the artist that the work that they're doing would fit so well with uh, the the sh the shop or the service that the some business is providing, and I think that's an opportunity that we need to look, build start building into our models because people, I think, come to those partnerships later in their career when they're, when they're more established and, and obviously bring more value to the table for a, for a business to, to engage with. But I think there are, are earlier, earlier opportunities that, mm -hmm. um, if we're not talking about, don't happen. Robert, have you had um, experience with corporate, I know institutional, educational? Yeah, yes, we have. We've been commissioned by corporations. We did one in Richmond, which was a very long project, expensive, very large. We were 
<coughs> involved in the project before the ground was broken. We worked with the engineers and architects and the money people, and uh, we had to, to almost establish residency in, in Virginia to do this project. We've done it with, with other projects. I think something that really is, is a little bit different that, that uh, Carol and I just came back uh, last winter from um, being artists at sea on a research vessel and it was the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Now this is a major corporation in that the Schmidts are Google, or were Google, right? So, so this particular enterprise is, uh, uh, was very well funded, and they, the interesting thing that they have, it, what they do is they have a research ship that just goes around the world all the time, and uh, uh, then they give grants to scientists to, to do, um, whatever research they want, and the ship's at their disposal to do whatever they want. The, the one thing that separates them from some of the other uh, research vessels like this, there has to be an artist on board all the time. There has to be a resident artist. Now, this is a model for research, right? And I'm quite sure the scientists, you know, are wondering, what, why are these artists on board? But they really believe in um, steam rather than STEM. STEM. Right? And STEAM is a very important kind of a concept of corporate artist thing. I mean, what if every major corporation in Pinellas County you just, you know, had a resident artist? Just that imagine be, that. Just that a, would be wonderful. Just imagine what it would be. And, you know, you, you, you're working sometimes, you're doing work, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're curating whatever they own. Uh, you're saying, let's do this different way. You know, they, they have different ideas. Uh, I remember when I lived in New York City, uh, Silicon Valley opened up what they called Silicon Alley in Chelsea, in, in, in uh, lower Manhattan, because what they wanted was they wanted somebody who thought outside the box. Mm -hmm. Even way back then, uh, people were getting too predictable within uh, what was going on in Silicon Valley. They wanted to try new new people with new ideas, because that's where things happen. Now, artists are pretty good at that sometimes, of thinking outside the box yeah. or being really kind of uh, out there in, in, in a lot of things. So, it, so I, I, you know, just imagine if every corporation had an artist in residence. How much would it cost? I could imagine that. And when you think back to the, um, you know, you reminded me of an expedition. Lewis and Clark, you're the ethnographer. Yeah, yes. You're on board yeah. and you're doing everything mm -hmm. that, yeah, an iPhone can do, but he does it better. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Ken, you were going to... Oh, I, I, I just love that idea. And look at other corporations that have taken that to heart, like Kohler Corporation up in, in Wisconsin, who's had their resident artists for years. I worked with them once. Yeah, 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 what a fabulous program. And it informs their entire workforce. Having, having this creative uh, work happening in their facility with their materials. I mean, that's the whole idea. Take our materials and do something different with it. Do something special. And uh, everyone, everyone in that place gets inspired by what, what happens there. Well, maybe we need to start thinking and maybe have a groundswell movement on this. But Sharon, give us a, a little bit of a, a take from, you said you employ 100 artists. Tell us how that works with. So we are um, the educational arm of Ruth Eckerd Hall. We reach about 45,000 students throughout the county, actually throughout several counties. Um, and it takes a team to do that. So as I mentioned earlier, I have an in-house administrative team, but we teach on-site, kind of classically what you would expect at a performing arts center, but we also work in several schools, uh, retirement communities, rehab centers. Um, honestly, anyone who asks for us, we find a way to get there, but that takes teaching artists. Um, so we started this movement um, about seven years ago, and it was just a wonderful kind of an experiment that we knew was going to succeed. Um, we took some of the best local artists that, as I said, were willing to learn to teach what they do because there's a big difference between an artist and a teaching artist and a teacher. Those are three very different things, but it just became this kind of a lab for not only the students to benefit from, but the artists themselves. So, you know, I have these amazing drama teachers and music teachers who will say, I never thought of teaching 
never occurred to me. I just wanted to make a living doing my art. Um, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it just has become this wonderful, as I said, sort of a melting pot, you know, incubator for teachers of all kinds and artists of all kinds. So um, we say all the time we're not just teaching our students, we're teaching our teachers as well. Good, thank you. I have one more question before we ask our audience. And I, I think I'm going to ask all of you, so think about this. You know, we have a lot of emerging, burgeoning partnerships that are happening um, in around Pinellas County and other places that, you know, you know of. Um, what are we learning about the balance of growth and creativity in these types of new partnerships? All right. <laughs> um, I tell you, everyone, I've, 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 I speak of this sometimes, and people hate when I bring up New York City, you know, as, a, as an example, you know. So, well, you think of New York, what the heck? Well, um, anyone care to guess what New York City still invests yearly in the arts? It's over $150 million um, that they're in, investing in their art programs that are amongst the most well-established in the world. But that's what it takes. That's what having that balance between uh, having a, a, a solid working arts uh, component in your world and uh, keeping one developing also. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and you have to have both. Otherwise, uh, we run into you know, like the 600 block and things aren't you know, uh, exactly going how they could. But that ongoing commitment from a community to keep supporting the arts regardless of how successful they may seem. I, I love hearing so often from funding sources that, well, we're, we're looking, you know, ultimately that you won't need our funding, you know, that that's, you know, that you, you will be self-sustaining. That's not a model that is workable with, with many nonprofits, arts organizations, or with artists who are, are working. Um, and so... I think, we, I think we have to start at the very beginning with a base commitment that, that says we're, we're going to, uh, uh, we're in it for the long haul here, we, we see the value, and we're going to continue supporting it um, uh, as, as, long as, as long as we're all here. So there's models out there. There are. Uh, yeah. What do you think, Robert? Well, I think uh, we can go back to uh, Creative Pinellas again. You know, they're, they're backed by uh, the county commission. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be continued and strengthened. And that's a place to start with all that, is that they, you know, the, the, the county commission and their commitment to Pinellas County, what makes it, what, makes it uh, what it is, other than the beaches, is its cultural attraction. And uh, it's, it's undeniable now. And uh, so uh, I, I think as that goes, I think the communities in in Pinellas County needs to uh, uh, need, need to sort of take that on as well in their own community uh, ways, in their own uh, city commissions and things. And to understand the importance of, of the art, um, I, you know, I remember when the Dali was trying to raise money for uh, the, new, the new museum, and they were trying to convince the, the uh, hotels out on the beaches to uh, share some of their their tourist tax money, and they were saying, "Why, you know, we have not. You know, why would we want to do that? You know, it takes away from that." And then somebody informs them. They said, "Do you know how much money people, uh, cultural pe tourists, spend? You know, and they're the ones out at your place. So they're going to to spend more. Uh, you're going to attract more. Uh, you're going to profit from it. And that's happened. They, you know, they, they, you know that that." been done in a way so but it needs to keep being done you know we need to keep expanding that whole kind of concept of we need to keep as you say you know just keep supporting but inventing at the same time i, I think everyone under, understands that we have to for instance uh, keep nourishing our beaches right, right? there's a, yes. tens of millions of dollars yeah. yearly yeah. Uh, spent on that because it's important yeah. uh, to uh, what goes on here um, and that realization that the arts are as important, or at least a partner in that quality of life, um, makes that further investment just a, a right. natural thing. It's also, if I may, yes. not, I think people think of art as the finished product, 
that they see hanging on the wall or a performance, not understanding what goes into getting it there, which is the process is the thing. Mm -hmm. And the people involved um, is what makes that happen. So I think in addition to the art itself, it's a commitment to nurturing and fostering and mentoring the people who are making that happen um, almost before the art itself, I think is so important. And that commitment has to be there by a community. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, the commitment of certain um, government entities is really important. And also working with those corporations, um, because we've seen this, this evolution in different cities, and we've seen it in St. Pete and elsewhere, where you have a model where you have an underserved community that has affordable housing. You have um, uh, creatives that move into the area because it's affordable, and then they reinvigorate, in, reinvigorate that area. It attracts other businesses. Then it attracts the money. It becomes a destination. And then the artist who was the driver of that uh, is pushed out. And you see the model in like San Francisco is a good example. You think about what that was like in the 1960s and it was the hub of all creativity and writers and artists and musicians. And um, now it's Silicon Valley tech giant and uh, the soul is, is compromised because of that. So you have to have someone fighting for that which those uh, ground rules and the support from government and, and major corporations that can institute some basic programs and, and spaces and, and collaborative type situations to kind of keep that at bay and keep, keep that balance of the overdevelopment and gobbling up of our properties so that we can maintain that soul. And that space is very important because it's a type of reverse gentrification. All right, well, we have done a brilliant job, panelists. And I think, uh, yes, a round of applause. A brilliant job. And I have to say, I'll, um, everything you all said has just touched me. But what you just said lastly was the language I speak, policy. You know, why the Institute comes into these spaces. I came in here in 1997, not willingly, and the artists are what kept me here. I say that to everyone who will listen that my husband is the benefactor of the many artists who just allowed the city just to grow so beautifully around the county. And people don't understand. They always ask, well, why does art matter? And it's such a strange question to me when I think about um, why it's such a difficult leap to make from art to the economy. But with that being said, you all said a lot. Um, and I like to speak to, for our, our students and for those who are in our virtual audience and here, if you have any questions, please text them to SPC Seminole 776 to 22333. Should be on our virtual screen. But again, for our in person audience, SPC Seminole 776 to 22333. We spoke a lot about how you all um, describe the landscape, but how to everyday uh, emerging artists get apprenticeships. Speaking to that equity piece, we talk a lot about how do you get here. And if you all could give your best advice on obtaining apprentices, this is one of the questions from a participant. I would use, again, the word fearless. I think you have to not be afraid to ask and to pursue those opportunities. Um, Ruth Eckert Hall is a nonprofit organization. People are usually very surprised to learn that. We also have two galleries in the hall. People are equally surprised to hear that. Um, but we've had patrons come through to see a rock show or a Broadway show who will enjoy beautiful local art on the walls. Um, and every once in a while, someone will say, how do I get my work up there? Um, so just that, again, self-promoting, you know, not being afraid to ask, to reach out to different organizations, maybe even some that you wouldn't necessarily think could be of help, like a performing arts center. Um, so it's just, uh, if you're passionate about something, I think you just have to reach out to anyone who will listen and who might be willing to help and who might have two galleries to offer. I mean, you never know, but just 
always being proud of what you do and not afraid to offer it out there and see what kind of opportunities you can find. They won't always fall in your lap, so you have to really be aggressive and um, proactive about seeking them out. Any of the other panelists have anything to add about apprenticeships in particular? Well, I think, I think the thing of, of an art community is, is very important. And I, I've, I've always uh, told younger artists uh, that I've uh, known and, and helped influence that art history is your mentor. You know, so you, you have the whole, the whole world of, of what's in the past. You need to know that. And uh, then you, you, you can bring it into a more uh, recent kind of thing. Who are the people that are, are influencing you? What's the context of the times? What's going on right now? I mean, I, I cut my teeth as a young artist during the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. I mean, my life was illustrated and soundtracked uh, with incredible stuff. And it was a very in, engaged kind of thing to be in the, in the creative aspect of, of share in that life. The fact that a lot of people didn't like us and didn't care about us and <laughs> told us to go away was another thing, but it was a place where you, you understood through other people. Um, I, I think it's important for a community to develop strength in, in its institutions like the Lieber Ratner with, with the art that it has, with the programs that it has here, with, with what Rukath Hall is doing with its education thing. It, bring, it does bring people there, but it gives them a chance to share their, their thoughts and fears with each other. I mean, um, you know, I, I bring up school, but uh, you know, I taught for many, many years in a, in a, a, a professional art college. And the, the people there really taught themselves. They taught each other. The faculty were there somewhat as, uh, as guides in a way, but, but we didn't have really that great an influence on anybody. I think the, their fellow students did because they saw them after class. They saw them all this kind of stuff. So they were in the context. They had the language of the time. They knew the music. They knew... You know, they knew all this stuff, and that's where a lot of this art came from and comes from. It comes from something, not necessarily just art. As I said, you know, you need to know art history, but you need to know your own environment, your own, your own experience. So uh, for, uh, get involved, I mean, for young artists to get involved. We always used to say to our graduating students, don't leave the art galleries, you know, go to, all, go to all the openings, go to the museums, go to all this stuff, keep your head above water, and you'll, be, you'll find yourself being used to being in that environment. And if you go somewhere and you get out of that environment for too long, you get used to that as well, maybe, unless you're really a self-driven artist. But, uh, so I, I, think, I think the social aspect is... is is, is what can be developed here in, in Pinellas. Thank you. It, it's huge. I mean, we, uh, when we um, survey our students at the Dunning Fine Arts Center, community is w one of the top two or three things across the board that everyone is there for. Um, having that support, having that group that you uh, engage with on a regular basis and uh, share your work with and share their insights. Uh, and and in, in a, so what ended up happening in a little community like Dunedin uh, has grown up this, uh, the largest art center, maybe in the southeast of the United States, the largest teaching art center. That happened because of that community, I think. That's exactly what, uh, what we're talking about. That's why people come. That's why people stay. Christine, did you want to add, you mentioned Creative Clay, um, which has a great model for getting people to work. But how would you describe how people can actually, especially our young people, obtain jobs? Well, between, I, I mean, it, it really does come back to um, just being involved because things aren't necessarily going to fall in your lap. And because we have the world at our fingertips on our phones, it's easy to be complacent about that. But the Dunning Fine Arts Center is the perfect example of, in the, in the most basic form of just 
going to the place, you're bound to meet someone, you're bound to make a friend. If you go to an opening, it's networking, and then that becomes something, um, it can lead to jobs and opportunities. We, the Art Center and the museum, have a great synergy that goes back and forth all the time about uh, uh, things that lead to bigger projects and, and artists that we can work with. Um, I would say, because I've talked to a lot of uh, younger artists and you know, having uh, just the basic skills of how to approach uh, someone or approach a gallery is so important too and getting that job and not being so aggressive that you're turning someone off, um, that's huge. Uh, my first job out of college was working for a high-end art gallery that in the Mid-Atlantic region and they, everyone that worked there, they were like a mentor to me, but I also realized what to do and not to do as a practicing artist myself. So you have, um, you know, again, you have to be your own salesman and you really have to uh, understand the other side of, of the, the coin and what this looks like as you're approaching someone and asking for a job and doing it the right way, um, having the succinct information that you need to share to them to really sell yourself. So it's, um, you know, certainly you can learn those basic things from some of the great workshops that the Art Center hosts and Creative Pinellas, but um, it all comes back to networking and knowing the right people, and those doors are bound to open up for you. So we define equity differently. Everyone does, if they're honest. But this question is from someone who wants to know how can we achieve arts equity in the community? Constant attention to it. I, I think we have to uh, uh, look at equity um, um, and inclusion in absolutely everything that we do and, and how we're, how we're um, how we fit into the, the, the puzzle, because it is a puzzle of, of fitting pieces together that work together, that elevate um, all ships, if you will. So it's... Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, I almost don't like to name equity as this separate entity that we discuss. It should just be part of our way of work and part of who we are. So anything we can do to just live it and breathe it, um, I think is hugely important. I think it's probably, uh, it's hard to uh, achieve art, art equity if we don't have total equity. I mean, <laughs> the art, art is, is reflective of and reflects its times. I mean, we, we are products of it and we control it. So if, if we want equity, we need equity. <coughs> I think from a, a museum standpoint, I don't know if my microphone's working. Um, from a museum standpoint, equity is extremely important because it's not always the identifier when you're putting art on the wall because we have standard practices for displaying information and sharing information. And so trying to be cognizant of, of consistently having equity on the walls and uh, through programming is, is kind of at the core of our mission um, and making sure that everyone is inclusive because we see ourselves as that safe space for dialogue where everybody is equal in this room because art is not discriminating. It's, um, music isn't discriminating, really. It's, it's, um, it levels the playing field in a way, and it opens up for dialogue and conversation. So I hope in that way we can be more equitable um, as we address today's topics in whatever it may be and trying to represent all voices in, in this space. I'm on a lot of phone calls with the dean, and I think she does an exquisite job of making topics that might seem difficult very digestible so that, you know, we have different departments and we all think differently from our respective lenses. What do you need from the community? This question is really important. How do art, what do artists need from the community and how can the community help? Because I don't think people know, like from my lens, I like to purchase beautiful things. Um, from all artists, I like to go to performances and I feel the footprint that I'm giving is supporting by actively engaging and purchasing um, things that I can buy elsewhere but prefer a personal touch from someone. 
what are your thoughts about how the what what you can get from the community or what the community needs to give rather to artists? My IT department is not going to speak to me for a week for what I'm about <laughs> to say, um, but input. You know, there's a reason why we have a, an address, an email address on our website that says contact us here, um, especially for what we do because we're involved in ticket sales and demand and things like that. If there is something you want to see, let us know. If there's something you don't want to see, let us know nicely, preferably. Um, but I think it's a two-way street. I don't think community members can rely on us necessarily to know you know, we have trade reports and ticket sales reports and, and all that kind of sort of quantitative data. But the qualitative piece is people interacting with us and saying, I came to that show and I loved it and I'd like to see more of it. And just making sure that that's a two-way street, a dialogue is very important, I know, to what we do. Anyone else want to add chambers? corporations, what can the community do collectively? I'll jump in on this Please one. Please do. Um, I think the countywide referendum is incredibly helpful because what it does, it, it brings up the next generation to appreciate the arts. They have uh, support in K-12, and we will make more artists because of that. So um, this is a big thank you to Pinellas County for supporting those referen referendums year after year. That's vitally important. I think we have time for one more question and I want to add one at the end before we close. This last question is something I think you all covered, but if you can give more detailed advice on what are the opportunities that students or young artists overlook, we do have our art club here tonight. So it's nice to have student participation from students who are engaged and are contributing at least to the area and starting young and, and activating. What do students overlook? Showing up, oftentimes, exactly what I think we've been talking about, is um, coming to, to Ruth Eckert Hall and, and seeing what's available there, coming to the Dunning Fine Arts Center and, and seeing uh, what's, what's there, all, all the programs that we might have, uh, what the uh, college has, a tremendous wealth of, uh, of programming and opportunities. And I, I think the more you avail yourself, like, like Christine said earlier, I mean, that, that's what opens opportunities. When you meet people and, and you're talking with people who are talking what you want to talk about. You know, if, if, if art is what you're interested in, go where the art is, like, like Robert said, and keep, keep going where the art is. And, um, and don't be shy about it. Well, I think... Uh, you, you uh, well, no, you go ahead. I just, I just, I just lost my train of thought. Um, I would say try to widen your focus as much as you can. Um, it's wonderful to say I want to be an artist. Never lose hold of that. But think about arts administration. Think about running a museum. Think about teaching, running a fine arts center. There's a lot of other different possibilities that you can do simultaneously while being an artist that really will only elevate what you do uh, and broaden your circle. So I, I would say that a lot of my students say, I want to be a performer on Broadway, period. That's it. They're not interested in anything else. Um, so aside from the tremendous odds against them, um, you know, it's just important to think of, okay, well, what's maybe plan B in the meantime? And um, like I said, arts administration is an amazing field where you can be involved in everything we've just said um, while still being an artist. So I would highly recommend it. <laughs> uh, I was, I'm going to piggyback on that go. a little bit because okay. you just... <laughs> I was going to go not quite in that direction, but but anyway, it, it did bring up one thing about. I mean, I taught in a pub in a uh, professional art school for 20 some odd years, and I would say maybe um, a dozen of my students, uh, and it was a it was a, a big program. It wasn't it wasn't I taught a class, and you know it was it was independent study, and, and the students had to go off in their own directions, and uh, but. Maybe, maybe a dozen uh, artists became really kind of self-sufficient artists. Uh, and that was a pretty good percentage. Uh, a lot of people say, what? I mean, you're, you're, uh, 
you know, you go to you go to some universities and it's like, you know, you, you expect, what, 98% uh, job fulfillment and stuff like that. You can't be teaching that many, many artists. And, and the thing is, you're not teaching that many artists. You're teaching um, creativity. You're cre teaching a creative process of, li of being, being in an environment where you're able to produce and, and, and contribute. And so, as, as you said, uh, uh, so many students go on to the other aspects of, of the art world that, that fascinates them even more. And in most cases, they make more money <laughs> in doing that. Uh, and the, there, there's the, the other thing, you know, like uh, I've always lamented that, that Pinellas County, uh, Tampa Bay area, is, is missing one thing. And in spite of all the really great work that the universities are doing, that the art that schools are doing, we need an art school. We need a professional art school, which has uh, a large resident faculty who are not constant. They come and go, and, and they offer places for younger artists to move up into that program. That's how I graduated in Washington, D.C., from a graduate program into teaching at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and, and because somebody left. And, that, that immersed me into something that I worked at for 27 years or something like that. And it, it, was, it, was, um, you know, it was important that, that I could teach, because back then the models weren't the same. We didn't have things in our pockets that allowed us to, <laughs> to, to deal with other kind of business things. I mean, teaching was pretty much it. As a matter of fact, I mean, living in Soho, I knew so many well-named artists. I mean, you, you know, if I gave you a list of them, uh, I, I remember I was once out in uh, Normal, Illinois, at uh, Illinois uh, University, uh, Ill Northern Illinois, and uh, State University, and I ran into Sam Gilliam there, and and I said, "What are you doing here, Sam?" I was doing a print. And he said, "Oh, I teach here," but he lives in Washington D.C. I lived in New York City, and I worked in Washington D.C. So that was not unusual. Uh, at that time, because teaching, even, even among the artists that you would think are well established, relied on that teaching job for their constancy. You know what else they relied on? Uh, benefits, yes. health, in, right. health uh, uh, insurance. insurance. Uh, again, if you're not part of an institution, you don't have that. And so, Education is kind of at the core of, of a lot of the things that we were saying. And, um, you know, like here at St. Pete College, you have the option to um, not only you, you're studying to build skills, technique, uh, but you also are developing critical thinking and um, other, other things that are so important about being a grown-up out in the world. But it also forces you to... Uh, if, if you're confronted with opportunity here that you don't uh, get out in the real world unless you go pursue it. But here and other universities, um, faculty are, are assigning you to go to things whether you want to or not, you have to do it to get your grade. But then and we see this every day in the museum because someone who's never had an experience before walks into this beautiful building that is unlike anything that you've seen anywhere else that's surrounded by this amazing art. But there's something that, that touches you uniquely and it's an emotional response. And, and that's, that's why we do this. It's for that emotional, soulful response. Um, but those educational opportunities often happen at the art centers and the universities and, and things like that. Um, so that's kind of, at, I think, at the, at the core of it, making sure that you're always learning. And that's the other thing is, you know, starting them young in kindergarten, and then these kids have an experience. They bring that home to their parents and encourage their parents to take them somewhere like a museum, like the Children's Museum in, in Tampa. Um, but then you, you never stop learning, and you go out in the world, you experience life, and then there are things that you still want to learn. So there are lifelong pr learning programs like there are here at the college that you continue, and you, maybe you've had a career in computer science, and now you want to express your artistic side. So you just never stop. 
you never stop learning, and it's all uh, places like this are kind of where it all begins, and for some people, you know, where it ends, too. Just a short story in, in, in relationship to this. Um, years ago, I don't think they do it anymore, but Art News Magazine, do they still even make that? Uh, um, you would do uh, annually a series on successful artists who started out or, or worked as museum guards. Uh. And, and uh, the thing is, uh, well, if you, you, know, you can't get a job making it, get a job being with it. You know? And that's, that's the thing. I mean, of course, here's New York City again. Mm. You, know, you have these large museums, and you have this large need for museum guards and things. But there's, you know, that, that was something that was really interesting. It, it's amazing how many people are really famous that started out. The other thing that they did was mentoring, which is not necessarily mentoring. Uh, you work for another artist, and you work in that studio. And there, there, there were are, are artists that have, uh, I know, very, you know, very famous artists that have maybe eight, nine, ten student, uh, you know, assistants in the room. It's very much like the old atelier system in, uh, in Florence. Uh, they're factories. And, um, you know, so the, the, the artist isn't alone doing this stuff, and so they, it takes somebody to do some of the menial stuff from sweeping up afterwards, from mixing the paint to gessoing a canvas, and, you know, you got to learn how to do all that stuff for that artist, to, to uh, doing correspondence or whatever the thing is that the artist... Uh, by that time, when they're successful enough to hire a, a group like that, you know, um, that those are opportunities, and hopefully, Pinellas can get to a situation where we have more artists of that that you know that that level to be able to maybe bring in assistance, and you know, universities again, art schools can have these mentoring programs, uh, so you can you can. Uh, wed a, uh, uh, an assistant, student assistant, to, to an artist outside of, of the institution, which is a good idea. I'd like to give the shameless plug for SPC because each one of you, we work with all of you, and we have that flexibility to turn your ideas into a project. So we may not have a professional art school, but I can give you an artist in residence program. I can give you as many interns as you need to help you. I can give you ushers, and I can give you people who are interested in the performing arts, and I can give you all of the art patrons and their families to appreciate what we all do and want to continue to do. So I, I really admire the flexibility of SPC and its creative programs to be able to be a steady partner. Can I? It's that ongoing support that we were talking yeah. about. It's, a, it's the basis of it. And you're, you're certainly well situated for it. You're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Eleven campuses are shameless plug. Go ahead. I, I just, I, actually, I, I had a, um, a full circle SPC story that I wanted to cap that on with that starts in the 1960s with a young man who came from a blue collar family uh, who did not support this young man to uh, further his education. And on his own, he applied to SPC at the time, St. Pete Junior College at the Clearwater campus. He had an interest in art that his parents didn't know about. Um, he had a class that the art teacher recognized something special in him, took him under his wing, and really nurtured um, his skills, but he also um, gave him opportunity and exposed him to a whole other world, not only in visual arts, but there was a librarian that also took notice and would give him free tickets to the opera, that would give him uh, opportunities to go see a ballet. And all of a sudden, this blue collar kid graduates with this worldwide perspective and this incredible talent. He was so 
grateful to these two, this librarian and this instructor, that he went on to get his master's degree and become an educator. And he ended up being a professor and a department chair at University of Tampa for about 30 years. He just retired, and he felt so strongly about giving back to St. Petersburg College um, that he has since contributed uh, artwork to the collection of the Lieber Ratner Museum and to the St. P. College Foundation collection. And his work is actually on display now as our special exhibition that is related to our architecture in the museum's 20th anniversary. And his name is Jack King. So I, I mean, it's just, it's, Oh, it's hard to tell that story without not tearing up because you think about this poor kid and this uh, family that didn't even care if he went to college and how he was compelled to teach future generations in art. And that gift keeps on giving and giving because those people are going on and becoming educators and professional artists. And it all started with that young man taking an art class at SPC in like, I think, 1968. Mm -hmm. So before we close, um, it's a beautiful story, and we can just name so many of those at SPC, but the Tampa Bay area is growing rapidly. And so just one word as we close for your thoughts on what that's going to do. One word, the growth um, to our county on the arts. And Dean, you're included. I would say change, and my second word would be hopefully improve. One word. That's so hard. It is. <laughs> um, hopefully it leads to innovation. Okay. Team up with Hillsborough and surrounding counties so we, Tampa Bay can be even stronger. Ken, we'll give Dean the last word. Continue. Dean? Support. Okay. Thank you all for hanging out with us for the entire evening. This is an important conversation because, again, so many people ask, why art in the economy? Why art in the economy? We actually have a lot of congressional leaders who care about exactly what you all talked about, about why people come and why they stay and it's not always for our beaches. So it's important to enlighten the community about why we're here and how we got here. So ISPS continues to do these types of programs, and we hope that you will support us. This is an election season. Our next program is on November 3rd. It's Election Talk with David Jolly. It's at the St. Pete Gibbs Campus Music Center from 6 to 7 p.m. Then our next program is our grand debate, which we're really excited with. We have a debate with three different colleges, so four including ours, and it's going to demonstrate the strength of the Florida college system and what our students can do. And that's going to be on November 10th virtually. And then we have on November 30th the State of Child Welfare in Florida. That's also a virtual event. And I think that's it. Finally, do we have any more programs? I think that's it. We're working on a housing program, and we will keep you all um, updated on that. Always fun to hold these phones while you work. And again, if you liked our program, we did a program like this with the dean last December. I can't believe it was already last December at the James Museum. We had an incredible conversation with artists just like you from all different genres, and we hope you take a look at that. We also hope that you continue to learn more about ISPS by going to our website or Facebook or Instagram or just coming to our programs. We appreciate the legacy that Congressman Young left us and we hope to continue to have these conversations and enlighten our community. Thank you so much for joining us.